to make their speech. After one minute, the timekeeper the time will say no one. After this, the debaters on the other team may offer points of information to the speaker. Debaters must stand up when they offer points of information. The speaker who has the floor may choose to accept or decline a point when it is offered. At seven minutes, the timekeeper will again signal one. After this, no more points of information may be offered for the rest of the speech. At eight minutes, the timekeeper will make a double signal like this. After this, the speaker must conclude within a few seconds. There will be a short break at the end of each speech for the judges to complete their notes. After six main speeches, each team will have the opportunity to make a four-minute reply speech. This can be made by either the first or second speaker on each team. No points of information are allowed during the reply speeches. The opposition will make their reply speech first. After three minutes, the timekeeper will signal once to let the speaker know they have one minute left. After four minutes, the timekeeper will signal twice. Before the debate, the debate begins, I would like to remind you to switch off all mobile phones and anything else which might disturb the debaters. Should you need to leave or re-enter the room for any reason during the debate, please wait until the end of the speech to do so. Audience members should be aware that they may not participate in the main debate. There will be an opportunity to make comments after the judges have left the room at the end of the debate. Finally, the audience member should be aware that recording this round is not allowed to since the team uh, since one of the team does not consent to be recorded, all audience members should respect the decision. I think it's just in the text. Oh, yeah. 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 I think it's like, yeah. Are we going to teach fine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> I would like to introduce the judges for this debate. They are Car Karen Markins from the Netherlands, acting as from the Wales, and Peter Hayes from Germany. In proposition for this debate, we have the team from the United States of America. The first speaker is Ella Michael. The second speaker is Akira Arya Dar. The third speaker is Aliana Grossman. And the third speaker will be delivered by Ella Michael. Pakistan. Acting as the first speaker is Muhammad Sajuk Gonda. The second speaker is Moiz Ali Sahanir. And the first speaker is Zaina Faisal Khan. The next speaker will be delivered by Moiz Ali Sahanir. This house would impose restrictions on the opening of stores operated by large retail chains in order to protect local businesses. It gives me great pleasure to invite the first speaker for the proposition team to open the meeting. have dominated and destroyed small businesses by abusing workers, exploiting communities, and flouting standards, all in the name of creating a profit. It is time for the government to take a stand against this principally and practically corrupt system, and that is why we are so proud to propose today's motion, that this House would impose restrictions on the opening of stores operated by large retail chains in order to protect local businesses. I'll introduce two substantive arguments from side proposition in today's debate. The first on how it is principally necessary to protect small businesses, and second on how this helps communities. But before I do that, I'd just like to clarify a little bit in this debate. What exactly will our world look like? In order to restrict the opening of large retail stores, we would stipulate that large businesses may employ no more than one-third of retail employees in a given area. The other two-thirds of employees must be employed by small businesses. 
We think that the areas that this entails can include things like cities and districts. It's up to that jurisdiction. And we think that retail stores and large businesses have already been defined in the motion. And with that, let's get into our first substantive argument on how it is principally necessary to protect small businesses two layers under this argument on how the government has an obligation to create equal opportunity, and second, to correct for abusive mechanisms that create advantages. But first, on how we have a principal obligation to create equal opportunity. We think that in the status quo, wealth disproportionately magnifies your rights and opportunities beyond just what that wealth gives you. Why is this so? Two reasons. First, wealth often lends certain individuals disproportionate power in society which allows them to disproportionately influence decision-making bodies, meaning that those bodies disproportionately uh, make decisions that. in favor of those groups, often at the expense of other groups. But the second reason is that even outside of this, wealth often opens way more doors than just the resources that that wealth gives you. For example, we think that beyond just being able to buy more stuff, you often have access to things like better education, which magnifies your success in life, and other things like that. We think that these advantages are particularly true of large businesses and apply particularly strongly in their case. This is true for two reasons. First, most obviously, it's just because they're so much larger than individuals and have a much larger power to capitalize on these benefits. But second, and particularly unique to businesses, is it's in their particular advantage to actually actively exploit these societal advantages rather than just passively benefiting them as most individuals do. It is literally their goal and their obligation to pursue profit and thus they're more likely to actively exploit these advantages. Because of all of these structural reasons that wealth creates disproportionate and unjust advantages over other communities, the government has a principal obligation to correct for what is really inequality in society uh, through this policy. Our second layer under this argument is on how the government has an obligation to correct for abusive mechanisms. So, yes, large businesses definitely have an advantage over small businesses. And we think that these advantages are often created through illegitimate means morally. Why exactly are big businesses often more competitive than small businesses? Usually it's because of things like lower prices. Let's examine exactly how large businesses often do this. A few things. First, they abuse regulations, either, either by using their power to exploit the government, de decrease regulations at the expense of society, and their, to improve their own benefit. But if that doesn't work, then to move to other countries where regulations are lower and exploit the fact that that is happening there and exploit other communities. They also do things like evade taxes through large resources that afford them legal mechanisms and things like that. We think that these are principally unjustified. Second, they often abuse workers. In the developed world, this looks like corporations like Walmart paying their workers paltry wages, refusing to employ them full time explicitly because they don't want to give them health care protections. This is morally unjustified. And even worse, in the developed world, when they moved to countries like Bangladesh and Vietnam and opened sweatshops with paltry safety standards and absolutely ridiculously low wages, then completely exploit these populations all in the name of lowering prices, dominating small businesses, and creating a profit. We think that yes, big businesses do have more of an advantage than small businesses. These advantages are often created absolutely illegitimately morally, and the government has an obligation to correct for this, balance out this system, and make sure that these unfair advantages are capitalized on by these large corporations and benefit them immensely. Now let's move on into our second argument in today's debate about how this practically helps communities. But first, before we explain the advantages of things like increased competition and second, protecting workers, let's establish how exactly our policy does in fact keep small businesses alive. Because big businesses can only occupy one third of employment in a given area, they have an incentive not to outright kill all small businesses because that basically means that they can't operate. Go. Do, if, if wealth is intrinsically bad, do you think that you would have a gap on the amount of money that one can earn or the amount of wealth that one can accumulate? Look, yes, wealth absolutely creates disproportionate and distorted benefits in society. And we're not saying we completely get rid of all wealth. We think the government has an obligation to correct for those distortions. That's their principal obligation. Now, on to uh, further why this keeps small businesses alive. So obviously, if all the small businesses in an area are gone, as sometimes happens, 
in the status quo, that means that big businesses can't really operate there either. So they're less incentivized to completely kill small businesses. And also, just obviously, this limits the number of big businesses that can operate in an area. So the first advantage of this is that it increases competition. As we kind of established earlier, in the status quo, big businesses effectively are incentivized to drive out all other small businesses in the region in order to monopolize the area. This benefits them in a few ways. This means that they can drive up prices, and that harms the community. They can also decrease wages in order to capitalize on profits, profits, and also they can afford to decrease quality because there's no one else there to compete with them, and that also saves them money and means they can boost their bottom line because that is their fundamental objective. And if it's not stating the obvious, this is just because they're the only competitive entity in the area. But in our world, where small businesses actually do exist, this means that competition increases, and that creates a number of advantages. First, it means that everyone is incentivized to perform better and compete with one another to create better profits, uh, products. They're also incentivized to keep prices low and compete with one another in that area and to innovate in general. And the second reason that this is so, and the reason that this is so incredibly important is because all of these things benefit local communities. We all benefit from better products. We all benefit from lower prices and things like that, just so long as they are created exploitatively and also communities and small businesses enable competition which creates this even more. But the second advantage of, the second thing, the way that this policy helps local communities is by improving conditions for workers. Small, condition, uh, small businesses systemically treat workers better. One, because they're more invested in the local community. Two, because they're not bound to shareholders that are just completely driving them towards exclusively profit. And also third, it is more harmful if an employee leaves because of bad treatment, because a small business is gonna be uh, more, it's gonna be harder for them to replace that worker and it proportionally drains more resources for them. So why exactly is this good? It means that better, better, there's better training across the board, small businesses exist, and large businesses have an incentive to treat their workers better in order to draw more workers and compete with small businesses in the labor sector. Because we think that governments not only have a principal obligation, but also a practical mandate to protect small businesses, we are so proud to propose this motion. The first speaker from Republican Jim Spence, 8 minutes and 24 seconds. For example, these stores, ladies and gentlemen, offer a lot, a lot of personalized services that a lot of consumers prefer. Not everyone wants to go to Walmart and get lost on their own. We think that a lot of people tend to prefer these smaller stores where they can get personalized services and which is why we believe that the demand for these stores will simply continue to exist. So they are driven away out of the market even in team propositions which have a scope. But second, we also tell you that a lot of these local businesses can simply make contracts or agreements with large retail chains outside of the particular municipality and even in that case continue to compete with these large retail chains. What is the need of team proposition? Why do we want to implement this policy? But fine, we tell you ladies and gentlemen, even if let's say they are driven out of the market, what right or what duty does a government have to ensure the survival of businesses? We don't think the team proposition ever clarified that to us. And if that's the case, why are they not simply why are they simply confining this policy to local businesses? 
if they if, if they say that the policy the, the government has a duty to protect all sorts of businesses and ensure their survival, then by that logic, Team Proposition would also be okay with the government protecting businesses that the government deems important. Is Team Proposition okay with that? They have the plan for. But let's uh, having that thing they need, let's also tell you why Team Proposition isn't even achieving their own endpoint through their policy. Because what was their policy? Their policy was, ladies and gentlemen, that our, in the, our model, large businesses cannot employ more than one third of the local workers. And in this case, local businesses can employ those two thirds. The fact is that even right now, it's not that local businesses can, uh, don't have the ability to uh, local businesses. It's the fact that local businesses don't have the capacity to employ those two thirds of workers. We think that even in the proposition model, those workers are simply going to sit around not have the ability to be employed. We think, ladies and gentlemen, team proposition needs to prove to us what are they doing for those local workers. Team proposition has taken a burden that they have not proven to us. But finally, even if they talk about that policy, how are they solving it? Because the disproportionate amount of resources don't simply derive from the employees, <coughs> or the, the, from the employees that you get from an area. These resources come from things like money. These resources come from things that have driven from large amounts of areas that these large retail show, uh, chains have existed over a large amount of time. We think, ladies and gentlemen, in this case, team proposition is not even achieving their own endpoints because they simply haven't proven to us why employees are the main reason why their disproportionate resources exist. Team proposition needs to tell us how they're achieving their endpoints. But finally, before moving on to our own substantives, no thank you, madam, let's ask them a couple of questions. First, if they believe that these large retail chains are simply so evil, why not outright, outright ban them? Team proposition needs to tell us why they want to, in this case, regulate or impose restrictions on them, because if they're not outright banning them, they're conceding to the idea that they do provide a lot of important services to local consumers. Or oh, second, no thank you, madam, would you also regulate local businesses if they become too big? Because even in that case, the same problem applies, team proposition has to clarify that to us. But finally, what are large retail chains? Team proposition never really defined that term for us. We think that large retail chain can come, uh, can become anything if the government decides it to be. We think that even a medium-sized store can become a large retail chain if team proposition talks about it. We need to understand what their policy really is. Team proposition needs to clarify that for us. Let's move on to our own substances. We as opposition oppose this motion on three main lines of arguments. One, no well, thank you. It disadvantages already disprivileged individuals by restricting their access to affordable goods. Two, it unfairly limits the right to enterprise of businesses. And third, and this is my second speaker who is going to deal with this, is that retail chains provide crucial benefits Sir. to the local economy and how you're taking that away through propositions policy. Well, thank you, sir. Let's move on to my first argument. How it disadvantages already disprivileged individuals by restricting their access to affordable goods. So how do these large retail chains help local consumers? These large retail chains, ladies and gentlemen, because of the size can benefit the consumers, particularly in the local areas that we are talking about. No, thank you, sir. Because of the fact that they apply particularly to low and middle income earners. How? Firstly, we believe that they are able to provide low cost goods because of the fact that these large retail chains, ladies and gentlemen, are able to spread their costs over the large amount of output that they have. And through economies of scale, they are able to provide low cost goods and cheaper goods to their particular consumers. But second, no, thank you, sir. We also believe that they also provide a more wider range of goods, or that the choice of goods that they provide is much more. So Walmart and Tesco offer 10 goods for every one good that the local business offers in a particular community. But finally, they also offer a greater quality of goods, because the fact, ladies and gentlemen, that they have greater quality assurance policies, or they're able to import higher grade quality of goods from outside. For all of these reasons, we think that large retail chains better benefit the consumer by providing a better cost, quantity, and quality of goods. Why does this mean now so that it is morally unjustified for consumers to pass, for the proposition to pass this policy? Because when they impose these restrictions and they conceded to this, no thank you sir, we think that they're saying that these barriers to entry will lead to two things. Either they will disincentivize people from setting up these large retail chains and so there will be a lesser number of stores, but even if the stores set up, they are more costly to the average consumer. And we think that that's really, really wrong. Because consumers have a first and foremost duty to their own well-being. That's why you buy products. So a poor person, when he buys a carton of milk, buys it because he recognizes that it is important to sustain himself. When people buy goods, they recognize the importance that it has to their own quality of life. I'll take any one of you in a minute. We think in that case, ladies and gentlemen, we recognize the fact that these, consumer, that these large retail chains are particularly important to these consumers and we simply cannot take away these large retail chains. Because the fact, ladies and gentlemen, that this policy restricts consumer choice and forces you to buy expensive goods, it is harming consumers. 
and we don't think that they have a responsibility to prioritize local businesses over their own well-doing. Before moving on to the second argument, go ahead. Here's how prices work in the long run. Conglomerates can temporarily reduce prices until small businesses are out of business, then they have a monopoly and hike all right, them all up. Right. We think that the market mechanism is a constantly evolving and self-corrective mechanism. So even if they're able to drive out consumers in the short term and hike up their prices, in the long term, other people recognize that we now have a market where prices are particularly high. And we can break into this market and offer lower cost goods to the consumers, which is why the market will automatically correct itself. We don't do that for right. stats. No, thank you, man. Let the second argument, how unfairly limits the right to enterprise. So why do you believe that everyone has the right to enterprise? We feel, ladies and gentlemen, that every individual has the ability to sell goods and services that they have produced or acquired, and that's the basis of literally every sort of trade. And we think that this right applies in every particular case, and is only pertained if there's a harm to the consumer. So for example, you have environmental regulations, and the reason you have those and you expect people to abide by them is because they can harm the people who access those goods. In this case, if anything, ladies and gentlemen, the proposition is the one who's violating this right by preventing access to these goods for consumers. But finally, why does this mean that the government has no justification to interfere with businesses in this manner? While you feel there is a right to set up your business that we, our as team opposition, are ensuring in this case for all businesses, including these large retail chains, we think, ladies and gentlemen, that the government has no right to ensure the success of their business or the survival of their business. But secondly, we also think, ladies and gentlemen, that companies do not have a duty to one another. We don't think that one company should be punished for the inefficiency of other businesses. And for all of those reasons, because we've shown to that we're the side who's benefiting the local consumer as well as these businesses, and our side proposition has not shown us how they're achieving their endpoints for opposition. about why we think there are simply put structural deficiencies within the market. What did we hear as a response from opposition? Three flippant questions that we don't think actually engage with the nuance that we brought you in government one. What opposition actually needs to do in today's debate in order to win is engage with the material that we presented to you, not just tell you three questions about why they think our material doesn't actually work. Two things in this speech. First, two points of rebuttal. Is our policy permissible morally? And second, does our policy serve businesses and the economy? And then bringing up our third argument. First, on the idea before all of these things, the clarification about our model. Opposition 1 wants us to tell you about exactly how we're achieving the endpoints. So why exactly does our model work? What do we tell them in government one? We tell them the status quo, we think large businesses have a structural incentive to knock out smaller businesses via lower prices. Why do we think this is so? We think we have an incentive to control all of the market that we don't think exists with small businesses due to their limited capacity. But what our policy does is fundamentally change their incentive structure. Corporations have a new incentive to keep small businesses alive so they don't unfairly undercut prices because otherwise they'll get penalized. We even tell you a second benefit off of our model. What is that? We tell you in proposition one that what you actually have, when you have large businesses' success tied to the welfare of small businesses, it encourages large businesses to help small businesses grow because that's the only way they grow as well. Here's what opposition wants us to say. They want us to say that large businesses are evil multinational corporations who want to control everything. Look, we're from the United States, but we recognize that capitalism isn't exactly the best. 
What we're here to tell you is that the problem with the current status quo is that there are structural incentives for why these large retail chains undercut prices, undercut small businesses. Our policy doesn't ban corporations because they're not evil. Instead, our policy remedies this market failure that doesn't receive a check in the status quo. So first, on the idea of whether this is principally justified, note that the principal argument, which they got to in about 45 seconds left, is just the idea that while companies are self-serving by nature, they don't have an incentive to help other companies. This is a very like sketchy principle based on the idea that corporations are inherently self-serving, that people are inherently self-serving. Look, we think people are inherently self-serving. We don't think that means it's principally justified for me to like trample over Ella if I want to like reach the next path on my corporate success. We think opposition needs a much more nuanced principle if they hope to engage with the principle debate. What is our principle instead? What we told you is that we think you have an obligation to create equal opportunity. Essentially, what we think happens is this. We think because of the wealth and power of large retail chains, they have a structural ability to distort the market in their favor. We would say this is most analogous to, for example, the way the wealthy in the United States and in many countries around the world distort the balance of policy in their favor over the poor. We think, fundamentally, there is a need to correct this kind of market failure. They ask this in the point of information to Ella. Ella says our principled standpoint is that we need to correct distortion. Look, I hope opposition can agree that government has an obligation to ensure that equal opportunity exists. Our principle is literally that simple. We show you why you have that principle. We show you how these large retail chains undermine that kind of principle because they don't actually allow small businesses to actualize upon their own opportunity. And as such, we think there is a clear need for government intervention. When government, when opposition asks us their first question in rebuttal is why would we ban this, we would say that's not our standpoint. Our standpoint is on addressing distortions. Let's go to the second point about practical questions. Does this actually help? What's best for the economy? What do we hear out of opposition one? It's just this narrative about increasing prices. We also think there's an inherent contradiction in their argument here because what they basically tell you is that quantity is so much more of goods and quality is so much more, but then at the top of opposition one, they still seem to think that people aren't going to be switching to large corporations over small businesses. We don't know what their stance is in this debate at this point. But let's take them at their highest bound. Let's say they actually restrict access to goods with good prices. We have three responses on this. First, we say that it doesn't actually matter because the problem, what we tell you, is that you undercut employment. If you cannot get employed, you don't have money to make up the arguably minutely smaller prices that they seem to think you have. But second, we bring this to you in a point of information when Ali asks, is it the problem that we think you, these large businesses achieve monopolization, which in turn increase prices? Here's what they say. They say, well, actually what happens is that when you have those higher prices, you see smaller companies trying to break in. That's exactly the problem, because we think when you have a corporation that's able to monopolize an industry, it creates fundamental barriers to entry that disallows small businesses from I breaking see. back in. So what do you do? On their side of the house, you shut out small businesses from the market, allow large businesses to take over, and you never let them back in. Yes? Who's setting up the barriers to entry? You, when you actually prevent large retail chains from entering this business, or us, when we're allowing every business to compete in the market? Okay, here's why your side sets up fundamental barriers to entry. What do large retail chains do? They undercut prices, they sell more quality of goods. They themselves tell you that. What actually happens? Small businesses get shut out of the market. So what do you actually see in these towns, in these industries? It's industries entirely controlled by one singular corporation. That's the most fundamental barrier to entry. I think it exists on either side of the house. What do we tell you in terms of economic points? We tell you what happens if you increase competition, you increase the quality, and you decrease prices. If they want to ask us whether we would regulate local businesses, we don't think that these local businesses have the same incentive structure and are fundamentally different. Like we tell you that these small businesses are far more vested in the economy, in the community's economy, than large corporations are. But if they can show us why their distinctions aren't true, we'd be happy to adopt their stance in any case. At the end of the day, the economy is only benefited when you have the more competition that ensues under our side of the house. They don't really have an economic standpoint in this debate. We welcome further analysis from opposition. Now let's go to our third argument about increasing reactionary policies. Look, it's very simple. When you have large retail chains literally invading small communities and taking over the e or taking over the systems, unemployment everywhere, we think that it has a disproportionate impact on middle to low class workers. Why? Two reasons. First, we think they're the ones most likely to be hired by small businesses and lose jobs as a consequence of big retail chains taking over. 
But second, we think they're most affected by the loss in wages from unemployment and from the lower wages that you get under their side of the house. So it, indent it continues these people and indemnifies them to a life of poverty. What is the result of this? We would say a new group of disenfranchised and vulnerable workers and voters rises up. What actually happens? We think generally politicians have an incentive to cater to groups, especially when it becomes large. But there are structural incentives why you see politicians not actually calling out these large business chains and faulting them for unemployment. Largely, it's the lobbying power and immense influence over society that we tell you about in Government One, but we don't think got enough engagement from their side. So what actually happens? Politicians end up using minorities to fear monger among these people. They tell you that all well, the people that are responsible for your job loss are not big corporations, it's actually minority workers. What did we see this in? We saw this in the case of Brexit, where overwhelmingly the people that supported Brexit were those who had lost their jobs to honor, like lost their jobs to globalization and automation, but blamed it on minorities because that's what politicians told them to do. We think this has three harmful consequences. First, is that it mainly increases right-wing reactionary policies. Second, it increases dangerous isolationist policies, but overwhelmingly, regardless of whether these politicians get elected, it creates an atmosphere of hate that we would say fundamentally discriminates against minorities in all of these countries. The only justified principle and practical stance in this debate is ours. are really, really bad and really evil corporations. Although we don't really know if they are, but the second proposition seems to change this conveniently throughout the case with the said, well, though they're not really that evil. But let's say that they are so harmful and so abusive. Why does the proposition not ban them entirely? Or even if not ban them entirely, why don't they take some genuine efforts at reducing some of the kinds of wrongdoings that they do throughout the world? So stop them from or crack down upon them subcontracting production of, uh, of things like clothing to sweatshops within the third. Crack down upon th things like them not providing worker rights, whether that be within the developing world or within the first world. Hold them genuinely accountable for abuses that they commit. But no, what Proposition would like to tell you that the source of or the solution for every single one of the problems that they highlighted within their need about multinational corporations is this: that we would reduce the number of employers that they can hire and uh, employees that they can hire. And I'll tell you why that means that they don't achieve any of their own aims. What were their two major aims that they painted out within their names? Gone down. Number one, they talked to you about how we want to reduce inequality fundamentally. And number two, they talked to you about how we want to lessen, let's say, the abuse of workers. So number one, reducing inequality, right? In this, what they failed to analyze for us was that large corporations actually get their wealth and their abusive powers or any of their large degree of influence from the number of people that they employ or that local businesses actually are currently suffering or struggling to complete, compete because they can't actually employ enough people. It has to be at least one of the two, at least the first one, and they actually didn't show us that because we don't see how hiring a ca cashier or extra amount of delivery people within your corporation leads to, leads to you becoming a fundamentally more powerful institution or corporation. How exactly do large retail corporations actually get power? They get it through things like large reach within advertising, taking advantage of economies of scale, being able to set low prices, even things like lobbies, like for sure. God's sake, right? We don't think that they're cu cutting any of that off or even considering taking, uh, taking that into account. The only thing that they're saying is that we would employ less people. And we think that if their end point within this was to reduce inequality, not only are they not achieving, achieving that end because these corporations aren't being weakened, but secondly, they're actually increasing inequality because very, very simply put, they, their policy means that less people will be employed within local areas or local communities themselves. Sir. Because let's look at it very objectively. Who do you think employs more people within a local community? 
a huge Walmart or Tesco's or Carrefour that is set up, or a few local businesses, let's say a furniture shop or a bakery. We definitely think that it's the former, and I'll explain this more within my positive case, right? So they're not reducing inequality. That point falls in opposition's favor. Secondly, how exactly are they lessening the abuse of workers? Because we don't necessarily think, or the link that they tried to draw was that less employees is proportional to less abuses. We absolutely do not think so. Sir, we think that less abuses comes from proper regulation, adequate law enforcement, actually cracking down upon things like lobbies that give these corporations so much power and sir, such a high ability to abuse. So what, while I've shown you that they are not actually fulfilling any of their two major endpoints, I'm going to make my second issue a complete even if. Let's say even if we were to concede that they were actually doing something with their policy, which is to say that they were weakening these corporations or that they were actually in uh, 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 they were weakening these corporations and helping local businesses, why it's still so harmful. The first major reason, which was our first opposition moral line of argument that they really, really didn't engage with. When we told you about how you are fundamentally harming consumers. Because under proposition, when you're trying to protect local businesses, who you're trying to protect are middle, upper middle class individuals who can get loans from banks and enough capital to actually set up their own business. The fundamental stakeholder and the most vulnerable stakeholder that they completely ignore are people in your lower most class, your actual working class that can't set up their own businesses, who are hurt now as a result of your policy, even if it was to work, because they can't access the same kinds of cheap food, cheap clothing, cheap commodities, and local businesses can't operate to the same level of economies of scale. What does that mean? That means that when you end up spending more on products as a poor person, you're able to access less. Literally, you're talking about families within the working class that are able to buy now less food for their for, for their families or for their children at home, simply because of the fact that is, the prices of food have now gone up. Or, because now it's become so incredible incredibly expensive to afford a salad, I'm going to go to McDonald's instead because it's incredibly cheaper and you actually deny these people rights to or the ability to access like let's say uh, uh, healthy food because of the fact that you know they're always not going to go for a cheaper alternative and that's something that really really hurts them within the long run, right? So we think that on that level what you essentially end up doing is that you harm consumers, you take money out of their pockets and you hurt the most vulnerable stakeholders, let's say even if their policy was to work. But secondly, what we tell you is that you fundamentally infringe upon the right to enterprise. Because what the critical analysis that first opposition made was that you have, as a, as a corporation in a minute now, no duty to suffer for another corporation's inefficiency. We don't see how second proposition has provided us any analysis of why exactly that's the case. Yes, ma'am? If you think that large corporations are so unilaterally good, would you actually create structural, structural incentives to promote their growth? No, we don't think that large corporations are unilaterally always good. We often think that they do need to be regulated, just not in the manner that you are doing. And secondly, we do think that in this particular case, they provide so many benefits to a, 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 a wider society within these local communities that it is actually immoral and very, very harmful for you to ban them, as I've already showed. And then lastly, they talk to you about how the government has some fundamental duty to reduce inequality, and we don't really understand that because even Large corporations can be very, very philanth uh, philanthrop uh, philanthropic, right? So if you talk about even Microsoft and Bill Gates actually donating like more than half of his wealth or that money coming directly out of that uh, 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 out of that company. Secondly, if the government had an overwhelming duty to reduce inequality, then taxes would like literally be 100% under proposition model, and we don't really understand how exactly their case applies there. But lastly, their second speaker case, which we literally think was incredibly far-fetched, but it depended upon one major thing, for them to prove one major thing, that they would actually end up increasing the amount of employment so that eventually minorities and people like that would not be blamed. And secondly, we think that they're finding or they're looking at in, improper causality for the issues of blaming minorities because it's not only stuff like you know that they blame corporate that they that they don't that they that they don't have enough jobs etc. We think that the way that right wing populism works is to capitalize upon hatred no matter what or all kinds of poverty. It's not exclusive. It's not an exclusive problem to this particular scenario. I'm going to talk to you about how large retail chains actually bring huge benefits to local communities and this is especially important because it engages with a lot of what they have to say. So when we say that a huge retail store has the ability to open up, a number of things happen. Firstly and most importantly, 
they're able to employ a lot of people and a lot more people than small business are, are able to. This is including employing people who work, let's say, in delivery, people who work as cashiers, people who work as, like, let's say, sales assistants. We think on the comparative, they have the ability and they, they actually need many more employers than, let's say, a local bakery or a furniture store, a store does. And so what they're able to do is hire so many more people, whereas small businesses don't really lack in human capital as a reason for their problems. Secondly, we say that it also helps other local businesses much more because these co corporations oftentimes set up uh, contracts or agreements with local producers and local companies, such as delivery companies, such as, let's say, meat or agriculture from local producers that enables them to cut their costs more than, let's say, if they were to import it. We think that for all of those reasons, this debate clearly goes to Sai Pakistan. Small businesses and for workers. There's a lot of class here. 
We tell you we protect small businesses because large businesses have structural things that disincentivize people from going to small businesses. Thankfully, they outline these for us in opposition one. First of all, they artificially deflate prices. Why are they able to do that? Because huge conglomerates can move into an area, use all their wealth to sell things at a super low price, and completely destroy small businesses. What are they able to do then? Hike up the prices. They talk about people not being able to access food. Where have we seen this? In the United States, we have these things called food deserts, where grocery stores had to shut down because fast food chains moved into the area and drove them out of business. Now people cannot find a healthy meal for miles. That is what happens when you allow large businesses to take over the entire market. We believe their world is one where businesses use a wealth of resources to set up and overrun small businesses. We control that by forcing them to allow small businesses a good way to compete. Now, why is this good? Why are small businesses inherently a good thing? First of all, we tell you they provide market competition. We tell you that when there are different goods in the market and there's not a monopoly by large businesses, not only is the quality better because everyone wants to attract consumers, something that they themselves bring up, but often prices are lower because they have to be competitive with one another. But second, we tell you that often they have better worker conditions because they care more about the community, because they're more vested in it and not in their shareholders. That spills over to large businesses when they have to compete with that model. Yes? Would you cap the employment ability of all large businesses? Uh, we would tell you they would cap it based off of their proportional employment to small businesses. Like That's been very explicit since the beginning of the round. We believe the only way to ensure fair competition is for the government to have a hand in this fairness. But why do we tell you that in the long run this ends up being uh, better for workers? Why are small businesses better for workers? First of all, because they're actually tied to the community. They have an incentive to care about the people within it. That's why they generally have fairer prices. That's why they generally offer like healthier food options, things that people can access and uh, they treat their workers better. Second, because they're not solely tied to shareholders. They're not exploited and they care about more than their profit margins. Yes, they might be trying to make a living, but that's not all it is. Third, we tell you inevitably you're going to see spillover because when small businesses become more successful, when they're not completely overrun, that becomes a model for more businesses in the future. So, third core question of today's round. How does this help local economies? Now, they bring to you an argument about the disprivilege. We think this is incredibly important, which is why ADT brings you several answers to it that they refuse to engage in. First of all, we tell you in the long run, there's less employment in their world. They try to tell you large corporations employ more people. That is just like factually false. 60% of employment is done by small businesses. However, the problem is that has drastically decreased in recent years because large businesses run them over. Why do we think large businesses might have, say, an incentive to make this worse? For example, large businesses don't care how much they make their workers work for little pay and long hours. So, for example, they might employ somebody in a place with no work right. laws to work twice the amount that a small business would fairly give. That's a structural reason that their world is more unfair. But second, we tell you long term, you jack prices, you increase them for absolutely everybody. I explained right. this at a point of information, a DT extends it, they don't engage. Here's why. Because when large businesses monopolize the market and when they take over all small businesses, they can increase prices all they want. But third, as Aditya tells you, other businesses then cannot penetrate the market to make it competitive again because these corporations with an endless wealth of resources control the field. The next thing that we bring to you is this argument about populism. We tell you quite simply, and again, we know this as Americans, when people in small businesses lose their job, the country goes crazy. Their response is, well, people just, you know, they, they capitalize on hatred. Like, yes, that is the argument. Although large businesses are at fault, it is minorities that are always blamed. All they do in their world is increase hate, create a scapegoat for people to use that hate. What is the last thing they bring to you this round? They talk to you about the big benefits of large businesses with only about 40 seconds left, so there's not a lot to me, with me for me to engage with. But what we tell you, as I already said, is that all of this is untrue. Small businesses treat their workers better. They employ 60% of a workforce now shrinking because we refuse to control it. We believe small businesses are better for the workers, for the economy, and for the world. And thus we propose.
60% of your population is employed by local businesses, not by large retail companies. Then by your logic, you don't really need your policy in place because that gap of people who are employed by local businesses versus retail businesses are already happening in the status quo when 60% are employed by local businesses, not by retail businesses. But if 60% are employed and you're still not solving the problem, if you're still having these businesses ride out, how is just increasing that number actually going to solve the problem? We think our third proposition actually inherently being contrary to the entire case because the premise of their case was the fact that you increase employment within local businesses by putting caps on retail corporations and companies. What you're going to do is you're going to increase the output. But if they're already higher right now in this status quo, according to your own facts and figures, then how are you actually achieving your end goal? We don't really understand. And we really urge them to answer this and reply. The second speaker said, if I want to find the value of success, no thank you, I don't have to step on LA to do so. That's fine, sure. But if you find a legitimate avenue to climb that ladder of success, then why then do you have a right or a responsibility to some other corporation to step back and say, no, you take our avenue for us? That was our principal line today. We said on first level, it's not a right for consumers to suffer. A stakeholder they refuse to analyze or engage with at all throughout their trip, throughout their three speakers, no thank you, sir. But how is our responsibility of one corporation to another? On a last level, we asked them this question repeatedly, why would you not ban it? And only a third proposition we actually hear an answer. And their answer was, well, the motion is telling us that we're supposed to regulate and not ban it, therefore we're going to. Then, as the government is the one who's proposing this motion, if the hearts are honestly that great, then they should go out and ban it. The reason why they're not banning it is because they recognize that there are net benefits that you drive out of this. And if we can prove to you that you get those net benefits without harming these local industries, we believe that we will this debate. No, thank you, madam. The talking about the two issues they explained. First of all, are they actually achieving their end goals? Because sometimes they focus primarily upon, we really don't think that they are. Or, but second of all, even if, in the best case scenario, even if they are achieving their end goals, which we don't think that they are at all, is it morally justified or permissible for this policy to pass? No, it absolutely is not. Let's deal with the first thing. Are they achieving their end goals? And let's understand the way that they made their case. They said right now, in the status quo, you have a problem. You have a problem that these um, corporations have control of the whole user over the economies and who have power over local businesses. For one second, let's assume that this need is true, even though we'll show you how it's not. But for one second, let's say that they do have complete power and complete control over small businesses. So how are they planning to solve it? They're planning to solve it by putting a one-third ratio of employers that you can employ in retail corporations with that that you can employ in local, in, in local companies. That's literally the only restriction or regulation that they've placed on their side. So let's talk about the need that exists and how that need is not actually met or achieved through their policy. The need was things, for example, like disproportional wealth, like human rights violations, like sweatshops being created, like environmental damages. How is any of that solved by you employing less people within your system that has literally no logical link or no causation at all? We think the reason why local industries are not able to develop is not because they have less people necessarily, but because they don't have the resources, the money, the capital, or the skill sets and experiences to do this. And just increasing the amount of people doesn't really happen. No, thank you, sir. Because even if you increase the amount of people who work within these local industries, you're not increasing the capital that these owners have, you're not increasing the resource that these owners have. So even if you have more people working in that industry, you're not that industry still not is not likely to expand. But the third speaker they said the way this policy works is that if small industries decrease, so will large ones, and if small industries expand, so will large ones. Even if that's true, in your best case scenario, these large retailers will still have a monopoly or still have more power or still have more hegemony and the ratio of the gap that exists will still exist under their model even if they earn less because the small retailers will also coincidentally earn less. We told you that these workers that they're part on about and are trying to solve are not really solving in the first place because the problem that exists right now is the lack of capital within these institutions, not lack of workers. So no, thank you, madam. So even if you increase or force them to enforce this policy and get more jobs, you're not actually going to have positions for them to have those jobs in because those positions themselves do not exist Four. and did not exist unless you increase the capital or those resources. And that's where we don't need the policy actually effective in the first place. But if they have less capital in the first place, if you force them to employ more people, the amount of capital or the amount of wages you will give per person is actually going to decrease. And that
that goes against the entire need of giving them more wealth, giving them more money, and solving the problem. But we told them that these problems that they want to talk about, for example, uh, regu regulation can actually be solved with regulation under our models and not by the policy that really want to talk about because it's not directly linked to the wealth that people have and you're not tracking down on that wealth. But moreover, in this gray area that you're talking about, and these lobbies are so powerful, how will your policy ever be passed in the first place? Why can't these companies just go and outsource their industries or outsource the countries in other areas? How are you actually solving the problem? We really don't think that they're doing so. And because of that, because of this first issue, whether they're actually achieving their end goal, does it fall yeah. because there's a gap between the need and the policy they've outlined? No, thank you, sir. Let's move on to a second. Even if they are achieving this end goal, we show you that they will not be able to under any model. Is this morally permissible? No, it is not in any case. First of all, it's not morally permissible. The argument was because this wealth is proportionally magnified under the status quo and they have more power and more doors of opportunity. Our first question, and we'll prove why they haven't answered any of those of this POI. Excellent. Our model is not an employment cap, it's tying the success of large businesses to small businesses by measuring employment metrics. It changes incentives and disincentivizes monopolization. We've told you that in every speech, and you've never engaged with that's what our model actually is. Sir, if you, uh, even if you have these employment criteria, you're not solving the problem because the problem, like your first few, you can see it. They still have 16% more people employed in the sector. So the problem really isn't with that. The problem is with the wealth that they have, that you are not going to feel by magically just forcing more people into that market to make a job that don't exist in the first place. And those individuals we talk about will in fact lose out. We ask them the question, why would you not put, for example, caps on wealth? An answer we never got. But moreover, we're talking about how it's unfair, morally impermissible to the consumers. Why? This is where our large part of our analysis or some are engaged with. So we really have detailed corporations of making this work, but industries, what ends up happening is that they have a larger variety of goods, they have a better quality of goods, but because they're competing with one another, by the way, you don't just have one retail corporation within an area, you have different. Wherever there's a Costco, you will always have a Target, whether there's a Metro, you also have another retail corporation. So because they're increasing and competing with one another, they're more likely to reduce prices. And who does that impact most? That impacts the consumers from your lower and middle class who are unable to afford these goods in any other means or mechanism. You are harming those individuals, they are losing out under your system, something that they never showed to us. We talk to you about how these, we don't even have this need exists in the first place because of the fact that you already have this personal touch that is linked towards local industries and you are more likely to buy goods from them or buy goods and things from them. But second of all, these abusive mechanisms that they talked about and monopolies, we don't really think stands in the status quo or within this policy because these monopolies don't really exist when you have a lot of multi uh, multinationals or regional corporations competing with one another, a point that they never show to be honest. But more of these monopolies are self-regulatory. Why? Because if one company has a complete monopoly, others are allowed to break into that by reducing their prices and that breaks the monopoly in and of itself. Because we've shown you that there's a huge jarring gap between the need and the policy because you're harming consumers, because they're infringing on the right to private enterprises. We are very proud to oppose. Eight minutes and seventeen seconds. Eight minutes and seventeen seconds. To conclude the case from the opposition, we would like to call upon the reply speaker of the opposition, Boys Ali Khan. If 60% of people currently in communities are employed by small local businesses as opposed to large retail companies, and these local businesses are still struggling, and these large retail companies are still exerting influence and such a great degree of control and power, how exactly is proposition model actually doing anything? Because literally, first proposition's case in this debate was that we would put a limit on, and this is exam, I'm literally quoting her, uh, we would put a limit on the number of people that are employed to one third of the people within the local community and nothing more than that. 
If third proposition wants to come up and just throw some English or some jargon at us that really doesn't make sense, they, the, their fundamental issue throughout these three speakers has been that they haven't given us any semblance of analysis as to why limiting the number of people they can employ will necessarily fix their own end points, which was number one, to reduce inequality. We think that that inequality will still exist, especially because those small businesses that already, under your own statistic, employ such a large degree of people that when now large companies can't employ the same extent of people, obviously jobs within that region or obviously jobs that exist within or in small businesses are already saturated, so you're literally putting people out of work, and if anything, you're increasing inequality on that account. Secondly, how exactly are you lessening the power of corporations to such a large extent that you would actually clamp down on things like abuses within third worlds when you like outsource production to them to like sweatshops because that only comes through efficient regulation cracking down upon these corporations and holding them accountable for wrongdoing. The issue and the real problem within this debate is that literally their, their solution to the problem is not a solution to the problem. If anything, it is not even a half solution to the problem. It's like maybe 1% at best, right? So we don't to this point, know how it will weaken large corporations, unlike things like, ad like limiting their advertising, cracking down on things like lobbies, actually regulating them for the wrongdoing that they commit, which are all things that proposition would have ran in this debate, but actually chose not to. And secondly, how exactly will it strengthen small businesses that already have so many employees and clearly are not struggling because of the number of employees that they have, already clearly ha aren't able to keep up with the low prices or the extent or degree to which these large retail companies can ad uh, advertise themselves or the degree to which they can actually reach out to consumers. So if anything, none of their endpoints are being met by this weird policy that they ran and somehow tried to shift in a POI in third opposition. But we say that if your point in this debate was to protect weak, poor, vulnerable people, then you're actually not doing that either. Because even if we were to accept this weird, ridiculous policy as having any effect on weakening the influence of large corporations, which was literally their first proposition case, we say that by weakening the influence of the ability and the, uh, 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 the ability and influence and size of these large corporations, what you inevitably end up doing is harming consumers, the same kinds of people that you want to protect. And this is really important. And this is literally where we take the debate. Because even if this weird issue of policy was to be entirely conceded by our side, we still think that at their very best, what they do is that they harm consumers, right? Because we say that when you don't have access to cheap products, when already the, the, the global poor has such a weak uh, ability uh, or like purchasing power, you actually drive people into more poverty when they have to spend more and more on things that they initially got for cheap. So what we say thus is that even if we were to concede to their entire weird policy in cases to doing anything, we think that you still harm the most vulnerable stakeholder in this case. And lastly, on this point of the right to enterprise, what we told you simply, and this is something that they never evolved to, is that you have a right to set up your own business, but not necessarily a right to have a successful business. We think that it is incredibly immoral to punish businesses for the failures of one other's efficiency, and we don't think that that's something that they ever adequately responded to. We don't think they were achieving their own endpoints, and even if they were, we still think they were harming the most vulnerable stakeholder. This debate goes far. The previous speakers had 4 minutes and 22 seconds, 4 minutes and 22 seconds. To conclude this debate, we would like to call upon the reply speaker of the proposition team, Alamai. be abundantly clear. First of all, we're saying that in the status quo, and this is plummeting immensely, 60% of workers are employed by small businesses. We want to maintain and preserve that, and at the point where their world absolutely jeopardizes that reality, and all of the people that are affected, we fundamentally think that their little quibble about this statistical analysis is really illegitimate. But before I move on to our first two questions on which side is best on practical and then on principle, let's clarify a couple more things. So we're not capping employment on our side. We are simply tying the incentives of big businesses to small businesses. 
by making sure that big businesses can't run small business offices out of the ground and completely eliminate all of their employment. This is just a measure of the, of the dominance and relative roles of small and big businesses. We're not saying that suddenly big businesses can't have any employees. That was never our advocacy. But furthermore, we recognize that large businesses can be really harmful. And if they're allowed to completely distort the advantages that they have, that can be really harmful. That's why we're trying to undistort these advantages and limit their size, not completely eliminate all, all large businesses and some of the benefits that come with them. We simply want to regulate. We don't want to absolutely ban. We've carried this down the bench, and they've just completely muddied this. Just because there are legitimate harms of a certain entity that we want to limit doesn't mean we think, or it is principally consistent with our side, to completely ban that, and as they have said. That's just completely wrong. But our first question is which side is best on practical? Their best argument in today's debate, and essentially explicitly in all four, the reason that they say they take this debate, is because they somehow think that they benefit consumers through boosting employment and lowering prices. Had they been listening to everything that we said in our case, we already have so many responses to this that went completely untouched. First, from Proposition 1, we told you that in the long term, the presence of small businesses, which are explicitly in danger on their side of the house, increases competition, which in the long term actually decreases prices. Because when large businesses are allowed to proliferate and completely monopolize the market, they have complete control over these prices and can just exploit local communities, harming the very people that they are advocating. But second, we told you about employment and how the proportion of employment from small businesses is actually shrinking and we think we should absolutely preserve this. Their claim that large businesses are the only ones that can employ lots of people on a massive scale is just patently false. We want to preserve a world where small businesses can employ people on a large scale and this brings us to our third point, actually make sure that those people are being treated well, that these consumers, these, in these individual stakeholders in society are actually being treated well, are not being exploited, paid ridiculously low wages, denied health care, because large corporations have an overwhelming incentive to do these things. And incidentally, insofar as large businesses may provide some benefits, they still exist in our world, we just limit all of the harm that they bring. But now let's move on to the question of the principle. Their stance in this debate was essentially we shouldn't limit the free market. As we told you, capitalism is not absolute. As we told you, regulations are an absolutely legitimate reason to, if, if, some, if a policy is really harmful, to limit a certain practice. And furthermore, insofar as the free market actually creates massive distortions that limit free choice and limit competition, we think that we actually win on that very principled argument that they tell you. They, never, they refuse to engage with all of the structural reasons we bring you from Proposition 1 that large businesses are disproportionately advantaged in today's society and actually can exploit and dominate over small businesses. So actually, in their side of the house, free choice and market equality is much, much less than our side of the house. And that in and of itself is a reason for us to take this debate. We prove to you that low-income communities, consumers, and the stakeholders that they advocate for are best benefited under our side of the house, and they refuse to engage with our principal analysis of how the government has an obligation to promote equality, something they, they considerably fail to do. And that's why we are so proud to vote.
the different judges interpret it differently and therefore weigh it off differently amongst each other. So I think it's wise to speak to other people. But I think that also does bring me into talking to you a little bit about like, strategy and style, is that you do want to try and avoid that from happening, that your judges go, oh, but I interpreted this argument to mean this, and they go, oh no, but I heard this exact same word, but interpreted that argument to mean something else. So I think your speeches were all great, but sometimes you could have been clearer on what the exact end conclusion of some of your arguments were, and what the specific analysis was that led to that argument. So you're talking on style, I think all of you, like there was like, which was definitely above average, and all of you did, did very well. Um, some of the people on the judging panel pointed out that some of you could benefit from sometimes speaking a little bit slower. Um, I'm probably not the person to judge on that, but in general, um, speaking a little bit slower could help. I think some people, it's not necessarily the pace for some people, but some people could have benefited from sometimes. Just take a break, breathe, and then continue, uh, rather than just rush your way through. Um, but these are all very small and minor things because in general I think we did great. There's one point I do want to point out, and that's something that at this moment in time I think none of us didn't necessarily bother either one of, of us, but could might be problematic in, in future debates or future representation. So at the moment we felt that, and it happened to both teams, that you were a little bit rude towards each other, um, and given that it happened to silent, I don't think in this debate it matters a lot, uh, and it definitely didn't matter in, in, in terms of the result, but there are judges around that are much, you know, that would take that much harsher and would mark you down much more um, than we might have necessarily done. So I think, you know, there's obviously such an element of sass that is allowed to make debates really funny, but certain moments you need to be aware that it could become rude and then you have to be like, eh, that was a little bit unnecessary. So try and avoid um, these kinds of things. So I think in terms of strategy, um, I think in terms of strategy, um, there was, again, in general, fine amongst all of you. This one very specific thing, like kind of reverted around the model, whereas I think you guys, or in a definition of what some of the words in the model, model meant. So a proposition stands up and they're like, you know what, the words of the motion are probably quite evident. We will know what like, largely tenures are, uh, we're not really going to explain what they are, what exactly they do. You guys then accuse them for not really explaining all of these things, but then don't give me a definition of those things either. That is unstrategic from both teams. It's probably unstrategic even if you think it's self-evident. Do not, the thing is, you don't have to necessarily explain it, right? But if you would have just given me two or three examples of what those large retainers were, you would have painted a picture of what the things are we were talking about. And those examples came later in your speeches, but I think it could have helped if they were earlier on, like when the, when the first speaker would set, set up the debate. But likewise, if they don't do it, probably unstrategic you don't take advantage of it by then saying but we actually we think that it's from these things and then you can portray it in a light that might be slightly more positive to you size because by just not by just pointing out oh oops they forgot to do it you actually give them all of the room to then still do it and do it really well because you've already explained them what you were looking for so i think this is just i think a, a thing of strategy that both of you could have improved on but i think other than that perfectly fine time management for some of you, like not starting your speech, like some of your arguments are about really late in your speeches. Um, but other than that, I think in terms of strategy, uh, all of you did really well. So ultimately the three the judges on the panel think that the uh, um, conclusion came down, the content boiled down to probably three main questions. So the first clash is something that became really clear later on and we did not necessarily think was the most relevant either. This is an idea of whether or not um, they will stay dominant, like those uh, larger retail corporations would stay dominant within the market, um, or not. Because property of opposition says, well, you know, either they stay dominant in the market and then their policy isn't going to change anything, or they stay dominant in the market, or probably on top of that, they stay dominant in the market, because you think that that's a good thing, right? Um, and if they don't stay dominant in the market, then that's problematic, and then you give us reasons for that. So I think that was probably strategically also wise to like deal with that on two planes, right? So either they stay dominant, which is, you know, your problem isn't going to be solved, but even if they don't, you think that's problematic. So that's strategically wise, really wise to do. But you guys then say, well, you know, you, you agree that they stay dominant in the market, but do you then explain to us that that's probably a good thing? And I think here, to some extent, some part of different judges interpreting different things came into play, right? Because you guys say, well, currently there's like 60%, that number is slightly decreasing, 
and that's quite fine because you say we link it much more to the effect that they have given and they are tied to smaller businesses and what that may be. Where you guys say, you know, just in general, the fact that they are there happens. I think that means that you could have been slightly clearer on whether or not you would find it problematic that they would stay dominant in the market. Because they kind of just made it seem as if that would be a good thing. And given that your numbers seem to suggest that they would stay dominant in the market when you talk about like how 60% of employer, employees would still work for these kind of companies, uh, sure. uh, work for these kind of companies, kind of then fed into their idea of how that would be beneficial because they talked a lot about the benefits of those companies being around, right? Um, so I think be very careful when you use those numbers unless you explain to me why it's not a problem that they stay dominant within the market and do that quite explicitly. The second thing that we want to uh, that we think that we can clash in this debate is whether or not the state has an obligation and to whom that's obligation not. Proposition stands up and tell, well, they already have an obligation to protect the vulnerable, right? The people that are now uh, exploited by very large corporations in terms of like their working hours, in terms of their wage, but even also maybe job accessibility when companies could just literally move out of the country and have their jobs somewhere else, and they'll probably exploit people somewhere else, which is equally bad, and you shouldn't do that. In response, we then get from the team of opposition this idea of, well, A, quite often it's not necessarily um, so it, it, in terms of like whether or not, um, what kind of obligation we have to get, a counter obligation where they say, well, no, 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 the biggest obligation isn't necessarily to the most vulnerable, it is also to companies and businesses in and of itself, and given that there is a free market, a government shouldn't intervene and should just uphold the free market. And they then say that the free market will be upheld because small businesses will always thrive. You guys say, well, they won't because um, smaller companies kind of buy them out, crowd them out, and then they will disappear. Um, some are just on the panel felt that we didn't necessarily get enough of an analysis of how that, that, that would work. Whereas when they say, well, they give us reasons to believe when they say people just like small businesses, they might know people there, they have the same culture, that might make us believe that some small businesses would probably still survive, um, survive in the end. Um, and then talking about like this kind of duty that you have to, to like, the, the, the lower people, uh, lower people on the ground, is when they say, well, on the alternative, yes, there's probably a duty to some workers. I think your duty was much more to the employees of the community, whereas their duty came, yes, we need to protect, but that's a protection of kind of like civilian rights, because when they say, well, prices are just cheaper, that's better for like, especially the poorest of the poor. But also they say, well, when you compare it to like smaller businesses, Often smaller businesses are led by the middle class, so all you are doing is protecting the middle class rather than necessarily protecting uh, protecting the poor people. Um, which is again why we then like why the judge panel in like in a majority in the end felt um, that probably in terms of protection that combined combined with the idea that we need to protect like businesses or the right to start businesses to some extent fell on their side. Especially because the right to that protect businesses was not necessarily contested by you guys, given that you were quite happy for like, those large corporations um, to, to still be there. And then lastly, on this idea, like you know, what is best for the consumer or like the individual uh, person that is working there? Um, you guys say, well, it's better for consumers when prices are low. Prices are low when there's more, um, you know, when there's more competition. There's competition there when you know they exist. But even if the competition is not there, those large corporations just have better structures in place to keep prices low than smaller businesses have. You guys then say, well, not really, because consumers are. And you, at certain moments, also talk about non-consumers. You talk about employees when you say, well, no, employees are got better off because when they are tied to local businesses, that means that when they, they either both do well, so they look kind of look out for each other, so businesses are less likely to lose people for jobs, but also more likely to like kind of like improve work, workers' rights and these kinds of things. Do so you think in the end? that made it a little bit hard to decide where people would be better off because at certain moments it seemed as if you were talking about like different groups of people that would be different, like you know, differently well off on their either side of the house. Um, which meant that therefore some judges felt that you guys convinced them that yes, all that matters is like better off consumers are better off, where some of the other judges felt that, you know, yeah, like workers will be better off and therefore that argument went to you. But given that therefore in the end um, the majority of the judges did feel that probably we should talk a little bit more about consumers and that was the best explained argument. Um, the majority of the judges that gave that argument to you 
buys and buys many well. Individual will be more better off when prices are kept low rather than when prices are will rise. So if you guys did try and counter that by saying, well, you know, the problem is that they might, you know, have a monopoly and then outcrowd it. But given that we didn't necessarily feel that you've proven the point that you would completely outcrowd smaller businesses. That was not necessarily the most convincing argument then in the end, whereas they were able to explain to us why small businesses would extend to some form of competition would still be there. And your argument on why prices might spike in the end was kind of reliant on this idea that small businesses would completely go away and therefore those large retail corporations could completely take over. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I invite you to like all speak to us uh, individually to ask for more and for personal feedback. So uh, and I want to wish you good luck. How does the slip go? Oh, yeah, it's because I voted for team proposition and you voted for team proposition. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.